Thanks for tuning in to our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. If you have any questions or want a little bit more info on anything going on here at Coastal, check out our website at cconceancity.com. Today, Matthew will be continuing our study on the book of Philippians. So without further ado, here's Matthew. So while we're back in the book of Philippians, we're not going into chapter 3 just yet. Now, if you've been with us for a while, we did something very similar to what we're going to do tonight. We did what I called a review to renew. And we did that when we got to the end of chapter 1, if you recall. So maybe you're joining us for the first time and you say, where have you guys been on Thursday nights? I'm going to do my very best to cover the entire chapter 2 in the book of Philippians. So at this time, you can open up your app where there's a Bible, you can actually go underneath the seat in front of you and grab a Bible, a tangible Bible, turn over to the book of Philippians, and we're going to go verse by verse through chapter 2. Now, why review to renew? Well, consider this, that memorization is the offspring of repetition. Let me say that a different way. The daughter or the son of repetition is memorization. That which is produced based on repetition is always memorization. How do I know this? You've memorized songs that you did not try to memorize because you've been exposed to them in your car while driving. You're picking up the lyrics because the song keeps replaying. And now you're singing along to the lyrics that you didn't know you knew. How? Repetition. I believe we are greatly when we want to get through a devotional so quickly. We want to read through the... Bible in a year because that's what the date says for me to do. I want to get to the next chapter. I want to get to the next verse. I want to turn to the next page. And we miss all of the gems and the truths that God has laid out for us. Not so fast, Christian. There's a lot to review, and I call it a review to renew. Because though I learned it all yesterday, I want to apply it fresh today. So that's what we're going to do. Chapter 2, Philippians. Here we go. I'm going to pull from chapter 1 to make a point in the beginning. And that verse is Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, because Paul's ending his discourse, encouraging, reminding the church in Philippi, we know them as the Philippians, to let their conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love that. You know what that means? Allow the weight of your life to equal the weight of the gospel. If the cross means that much to you, Christian, you church, that the Lord took away your sin, he actually threw it as far as the east is from the west, he actually plunged it into the deepest parts of the sea, and the sin that you and I have committed, he remembers no more. If that is enough, wouldn't that move you? Shouldn't that move you? Shouldn't the conduct or the character or the conversation of the Christian, shouldn't it be different? Shouldn't it be attractive? Shouldn't it be contagious? Shouldn't your life weigh as much as the gospel? So for Pete to exhort and say, let us get on our knees, that's not something that is like far-fetched for the believer. In fact, if my heart is bent, my knees should bow. And if we can't do it in here, cannot convince me that you're living a broken life out there. A broken life is attractive. It's saying that I am open and vulnerable before a God who created me. And I live that way. That's called transparency. And when people see the lives that live so open, they see Jesus because we are broken vessels. I want his life to flow through me. So let my conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he warns them about external persecution. Now, to be a Christian today is not popular. Newsflash. To be a Christian today is not politically correct. Newsflash. Spoiler alert. To be a Christian today is to expect persecution. Did you get that? Not popular. Not politically correct. It's to expect persecution. And the church as they were championing the gospel, they were persecuted. But every time the enemy persecuted them externally, they just spread like a fire being brushed by the wind. So imagine the enemy saying, if I can't get them from the outside in, I could get them from the inside out. But watch this verse. Verse 29. 
For to you, Christian, it has been granted on behalf of Christ. Now that word granted lends itself to a definition. That word granted means it has been graced. It has been given. It has been graced, not only to believe in him, of course. I've been given the, given the grace and the faith to believe in God. That's amazing. But watch this next part. Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. I don't like that. I, I would rather rip that out of my Bible. It has been graced, given to me freely, to suffer? How is that a gift? Oh, it's the most beautiful gift. If you understand God's economy and how he actually allows us to suffer to save us, I'm going to talk about five different things or steps that suffering accomplishes. Now, as a believer who's suffering, I am not talking about suffering or consequences that happen at the hands of my bad decisions. But God can use that too. God can use a bad decision. I am the epitome of a bad decision that God said, I will recycle and use for my glory and your good. Go. I'm talking about suffering that happens, maybe agitations, frustrations, trials, hardships, things that have happened to the people that I'm looking at right now. Unexpected. Tragedy. Slam. It's in that suffering right there that the believer has a decision to make. Do we turn to heaven and say, why me? Why is that happening to me? How could you let that happen to me? How could I, Father, be the one you chose to lose a child? That's suffering. Why me? Why did my spouse up and leave me? Why did my child go wayward? Why am I dealing with family members that are struggling with addiction? Suffering. Here's the real question. The real question isn't where suffering came from. The real question is, what did suffering come for? Because you can sit back and go, did the enemy allow this? Did the enemy cause this? Did God allow this? And then we get so wrapped up in trying to figure out where's the suffering coming from, and God says, don't worry about where it came from. Worry about what it came for. And this is what it came for. Point number one, suffering enables us to see Jesus. I wonder why. Because if I don't experience suffering, I get comfortable. Any mother in here who bore a child knows that truth. It was a suffering. It was a pain that produced a joy. And then you appreciate the joy and you forget the suffering. The suffering that the Lord allows me to go through, like an athlete that has to be pushed beyond my comfort zone to gain momentum and progress and strength. Suffering is the agent that allows that to happen in my life. Suffering is the agent that allows me to see God clearer. How? Because suffering detaches me from the world around me. Anybody comfortable in this world? And then you wonder why God allows suffering? Because it's detaching you from the world around you, and it's supposed to get you to attach to the world above you. Suffering will enable you to see Jesus clearer. Suffering exposes sin in us. You know when you thought you were patient? This is such a minor example, but you thought you had patience until you got behind that one car that was going slower than the speed limit. And then that suffering exposed in your heart what was there all along, but you didn't see it. Do you understand? Suffering exposes sin in us. Suffering will reveal where my heart really is. And the Lord loves me that much that he says, I'm going to allow the suffering to touch you because I want to show you what's really in you. Suffering, number three, educates us to sympathize with others. Without suffering, I got nothing to give you, church. I can't empathize with you. I cannot relate to you. I cannot sympathize with you. I cannot feel your pain because I didn't go through any pain without suffering. Suffering educates me, teaches me how to minister more effectively. Suffering did that. The book didn't teach me any of that. Reading a textbook did not teach me how to minister to the hurting. The Lord says, I'm going to allow suffering, son, in your life because I want to en enable you to see me. I want to expose sin in you, and I want to educate you so you can be a sympathizer to the people that I'm going to put in your life. Suffering engages us into sanctification. Suffering sets us apart. Suffering, then, as it sets us apart, allows God to form Jesus in us. And as I'm set apart, because that's what suffering does, it allows me to exercise my salvation. <laughs> 
witnessed many of you in here who were suffering, but I saw your salvation activated. I saw a real peace, peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace from only heaven. And as the suffering touched your life, you had a steady peace about you. It wasn't robotic. It wasn't detached from the experience, but it was real. And that's what suffering allowed you to do. It showed the people in your life that salvation is real. Verse 1, chapter 2, because therefore is the hinge that Paul uses to drag all those thoughts from the previous chapter into the next chapter. He says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and any mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. But not so fast, because watch the transition. He just went from encouraging them and challenging them to be on guard against external opposition to turning the urge or the exhortation to be on guard against internal divisions. How do we as a church, how do you as an individual Christian stay on guard against internal divisions? you got to think about the perfect community of the Trinity. What do I mean? When you think about the perfect community of the Trinity, Father God, Father Son, Father, or God the Son, God the Father, God the Spirit. When you, when you think about the perfect unity, community of the Trinity, that should be the reflection of the Christian. That should be the reflection of the church. How so? Well, in that relationship, the Trinity, you have perfect submission, you have perfect diversity, you have perfect reciprocity, you have perfect harmony, you have perfect sacrifice, the Trinity, the way the Father operated with the Son, the way the Son responded to the Spirit, that's perfect unity. That's why Paul begins by saying, hey, you ever been encouraged by Christ? You guys want to bring me a hand up? Have you ever experienced encouragement in Christ? Have you ever experienced the great love of the Father? Have you ever experienced... <laughs> Have you ever experienced the great love of the Father? Check. Have you ever experienced consolation? That's the word in Christ. Check. Have you ever experienced fellowship of the Spirit? Check. If there's affection, Come passion, in. and mercy extended out of that, Paul says, fulfill my joy. Check. Or two, we are changing minds. That made me sound good. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm going to pray and we're going to go home right now. Paul is reminding the believer, he's reminding you and I about the Trinity in this first two verses. And he's saying, my joy is filled up when you have a singleness of mind about how you're operating as a Christian amongst those you live with, your family and even the spiritual family. Why is that crucial? Because here's my point. It is of little value, of course, to be unified against the opposition out there if we're not unified right here. So put down the banner, put down that sign that protest sign, stop rallying for a cause showing that you're unified when you can't even get along with the brother or sister in Christ right next to you. Didn't Jesus say something like that? I'm pretty sure he did. He said, hey, if you go to the altar and you're gonna give a gift and you recognize the fact that you might have slighted someone or somebody has a grudge against you or you did something and it comes up in your heart, put down the gift and go be reconciled to your brother. Go make it right there. Why? Because I don't want any division or fractures in my church. Why? Because if we are a reflection of the Trinity, God, and we're not acting in perfect community, then we give the world an excuse to say, oh yeah, if they're supposed to be all about love, then why don't they even get along? Jesus said that. Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. I love talking back to the Word. 
I can't do that, God. I can't love some of these people. And then he continues, just as I loved you, Matthew. You love the way I loved you. That's how you're to love. And then he says, by this, the world will know that you are my disciples, the way you love each other. You see the banner that God hangs over the Christian or the church? So you might ask, what's your marketing tactic here at Coastal Christian? Well, we don't buy billboards on the Atlantic City Expressway advertising how much we love. We could. We don't put advertisements out online. We could. We literally believe here at Coastal Christian that our marketing strategy is for the people to live marked by the love of Christ. And when you're out there in the community living as if you're marked by the love of Jesus, that's the advertisement. That's the marketing strategy. When people come through these doors for the first time and they feel love, they feel the warmth of the believer. And I've heard from people saying, I've walked in and I felt out of place, but the moment I met one of your greeters or one of your ushers, I instantly felt like I belonged. That's love. Whether you're wearing a trash bag, seriously, you can come off the street. If you don't feel love entering God's house, please. Come and tell me, because I'll be the first to correct that. We are to love the unlovable. Therefore, Paul says, if you've experienced anything by being a believer, fulfill my joy. So how do we do that? Can I tell you how we do that? How do you love? How do you operate out of the gospel? Paul says, put people in their place. You ever heard that phrase? It's usually used in a negative, isn't it? I'm going to put them in their place. And Paul goes, yeah, yeah, that's the spirit. That's the attitude. Yeah, let's put people in their place. And then he would write in verse 3 and 4, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You want to put somebody in their place? Esteem them better than yourself. That's the place you're to put them in. Esteem them better than yourself. He continues, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Notice he's saying, I'm not telling you to neglect your own well-being. I'm asking you to look out for your interests. That's good. But I'm also asking you to look out for the interests of others. That's God. So in this verses 3 and 4, I see something remarkable. I see Paul laying out the pathway to greatness. Did you catch that? And this is nothing new. This is what his master, Jesus, laid out for the believers. So while the world was posturing for greatness, they were posturing to be served, Jesus said, you got it all wrong. The world defines greatness with a question about numbers. You know that question? How much money do you have? Or how many people serve you? There's the question. Yet Jesus defines greatness with the humble question, how can I serve you? You see the complete difference? The world says, you want to be great? Make a lot of money, have a lot of servants. Jesus says, you want to be great? Ask the question, how can I serve you? I would be first to admit, in my earlier days, I had the mentality that said, here I am. When I entered the room, here I am. But the believer's mentality should transform to, there you are. How many have that mentality? The here I am mentality, look at me. But when you encounter Christ, that mentality changes there you are. There you are. How can I serve you? How can I come alongside of you and support you? How can I help you? How can I encourage you? How can I pour out something into you that you don't have? That's the believer's calling. Very quickly, the believer might respond to a letter like this. Well, that's too much to ask, Paul. That's a lot to do, to consider others over myself, to esteem them. And then he gives a case study in Jesus Christ, verse 5 through 7. Okay, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You don't think you can obtain that mind? This is the mind that Jesus had. Let that mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Oh yeah, by the way, who being in the form of God, verse 5, who being God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Translation, you cannot rob that which is already yours. Jesus is God. Jesus, God. And he couldn't steal nor rob the very nature that was already his. Being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That literally means, translation, he emptied himself. Now they call this the doctrine of kenosis, the most profound and the deepest doctrine in the Bible. 
considering the implications of what it's saying. A lot of biblical scholars and theologians to this day will debate what did he mean when he said he emptied himself. When Jesus emptied himself, what did he empty himself of? You can get caught up in that confusion. Of course, he emptied himself of his divine powers, but not his divinity. He remained God fully. So by using the subtraction or addition analogy, when he emptied himself, it wasn't by subtraction. He did not cease to be God. He didn't subtract anything about his divinity from himself. Fully God. When he emptied himself, it was by addition. He took on himself humanity. God wrapped himself in flesh, taking the form of a bondservant, but not just any human. He chose the lowest form of humanity, a bond slave. He chose to be a slave. And then it gets even deeper. Coming in the likeness of men, what does that mean? It means he chose to be birthed through a womb. It wasn't just a created being at full age. He wasn't a mechanical messiah. He wasn't robotic. He chose to go into a womb. He chose to be birthed so he could feel every single thing his people, his creation would feel. Jesus deserves, out of this text, full glory. Doesn't he? Yet he emptied himself. We deserve no glory. Yet we are often so full of ourselves. That's an indictment against me. Because a lot of times I am full of myself. And I have a God who emptied himself. A God who subjected himself to humanity. And he deserved all glory. And humanity turned on him, rejected him. Humanity spit on him. Humanity curled up their fist and struck God. And if you consider what Colossians says about Jesus being the sustainer of all things. You know what that means? Jesus holds all things together. The universe, he holds it together. The moment he snaps his finger, it will fall apart. The sky will unravel. He holds every single person in this room, believer and non-believer alike, he holds you together. The very molecules, the very atoms that make you you, your skeletal structure, all of it, Christ holds together. In fact, the very mouth muscles that had to build up to get mucus to spit in his face. Jesus held that person's face together to allow him to do it. The very wrist that was holding a hammer and the amount of muscles that it takes to hammer those nails into his hands, Jesus sustained that very hand to be able to hold the very hammer that would penetrate his very skin. He deserves all glory, yet he emptied himself. I deserve no glory, yet foolishly, pridefully, I am full of myself. It gets a little bit more profound. Watch this. He came as a man in the likeness of a man, and then he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. So not only did he become a man, born, born through a woman, he then humbled himself to die humbled himself in life, and then it gets even more compelling. He humiliated himself in death. Because he didn't just become obedient to the point of death. Paul adds a parenthetical addition, a context. Oh yeah, even the death of the cross. The most humiliating, the most degrading, the most heinous form of execution designed by man. God chose that for himself. If that don't move you, I do not know what will. That God humbled himself in life, chose humiliation and death. God on a cross, church. God on a cross for us. Took your sin, your guilt, your shame. The cross exclaims, I love you. Yeah, yeah, I know you're going through it. I know you're questioning why I allowed that to touch your life. But remember the cross, if I did that, don't you know I love you? Don't you know I could see what you can't see? If I chose the instrument of death to bring about life, wouldn't you agree you don't know what I know? 
Paul is reminding the church, he's reminding Coastal Christian in 2018 the importance of humbling ourselves and serving like Jesus. Well, what was the exaltation? Because it didn't just end in humiliation. Watch this. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Not might bow. Every tongue shall confess. Oh yeah, by the way, those who have already died under the earth, those who are currently on the earth, and even those who are on the other side in heaven, all of them, let me just say it like this. In hell, there's no atheists, but there's also no more individuals who believe in Buddha. There's no more people that believe in Allah. In hell, at that point, their faith in something that's not true is now completely true. They now have perfect faith in hell that God is who he said he is. On Sadly, it's too late. See, the faith at that moment is a faith forced to submission because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It's curious to me because what we'll do for eternity, church, is worship. Did you know that? You read Revelation, you will worship God for eternity, which is kind of curious because some of you don't like worshiping now. So heaven's going to be pretty miserable for you. Real talk. Because I'm worried about what you think of me, so I can't worship him. I'm worried about what you'll think of my hands being raised. Because I didn't come from that type of denomination. Well, this ain't about denomination. This is about salvation. Amen. Can't get on my knees. And I'm not saying those are prerequisites to salvation, but what I am saying, the body moves when the soul moves. And I am saying clearly... One day, it will be a mandate by force for every knee to bow and every tongue to confess. And I'm saying, I want to be that person that does it willfully now. I want to worship now. I want to talk about Jesus now. I want to get on my knees now. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 12, therefore, look at that word again. Remember that word, therefore, is connecting us to the previous thoughts. Paul is saying, in light of what I just laid out, in light of having the mind of Christ in you, this mind, oh yeah, by the way, being God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, actually emptied himself, and he actually took on humanity, but not just took it on humanity, he was born as a baby, then he grew, and then he chose death, but not just any death, he chose the death of the cross. That name is going to be exalted above all names. Therefore, Paul writes, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying, out of all that, now it's time to work out your salvation. A mom and dad can't work out your salvation for you. A grandparent can't work out your salvation for you. We'd love to. I can't, as a pastor, work out the congregants salvation for them. Pastor Matt and I would love to. We'd love to be able to work out your salvation. But it's very explicit. It says the church at large is to work out our salvation with a serious thought about us. That's fear and trembling. We're also to work out our salvation individually. So like an athlete that's working out, what happens at the end of a workout? You push through the pain. You push through the exhaustion. But at the end of it, you have progress, just like anybody bench pressing. I love the analogy of bench pressing because I put on certain weights, and as I'm pushing it up and I'm actually shaking... Fear, trembling, I'm struggling to get up my weights, and then the Holy Spirit comes and just takes it and spots me. Boom. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Translation, it's God's sovereignty that works his grace in, leaving it our responsibility to work his grace out. Can I conjecture? I'm conjecturing out of one scripture in Psalms that says, and in his book, the days were written, all of them fashioned before me when there were none of them. Your calendar of your life 
was written in advance. Before you even were a thought by mom and dad, the Lord actually saw you. Then he actually knitted you in that very womb. And then he actually calendared your days before you even had one. Every day was written in his book, which means he knew every single thing that would enter your day. You didn't. But if I know that he knows, shouldn't that give me peace as I walk through them? So what am I saying? I'm saying God's grace was interwoven through every one of your days. Even the most horrific day, the hardest day that you have faced or will face, God's grace was written through that day. And you could choose to do one thing, grumble, or you can choose to do another thing, trust. And that's the responsibility of the believer. Because the very next verse says the fastest way or the quickest way to mar the gospel, the goodness of God's grace in your life is to begin to grumble. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Did you catch that? See, God's grace is constantly flowing. Can't stop God's grace. His unmerited grace, his good grace, his gift freely given to us, even though we are in and of ourselves disgraces, God's grace is woven into your day. And he says, now it's your responsibility to work it out. Oh, no, yeah, the quickest way to stop my grace from actually flowing through your life is just start complaining. Start complaining. Complaining is internal. That's what that word means. It begins in the heart. You start murmuring. And what is the word disputing here? Translated, it's when you affirm somebody else's complaint. You know, when somebody's complaining in the grocery store, what's the first thing they do? They look for an ear to be heard. They're in that line talking to them. What's taking so long? I don't understand why every time I get in the line, they have to change out and go to another shift. Now I'm stuck here waiting. And then they turn around, and there you are. <laughs> and we so easily go, I know. I can't believe it. And all I've done is affirm somebody else's complaint. Now, in a more devastating way, it happens here in church. You believe that? They had to change the mic out twice in the middle of the sermon? And we affirm the complaint. Complaining as a believer is an indictment against God's grace. The moment I complain, I'm saying, God, you're not good enough to supply my needs. Now, it's dangerous as a family because I wouldn't let my brother talk about my daddy. Nope. One of my blood brothers starts bad-mouthing my father. I'm going to defend him. Yet we don't in regards to our Heavenly Father, do we? We let a brother or sister Bad mouth God. Where was God when this happened to my family, Matt? Really? You're talking about my father in heaven like that? But we don't want to defend that like that. No, we go right along. We give them the, the sympathy. We have food bad for them. And the father in heaven just shakes his head and goes, that's an indictment against my character. That's the kink that disgraces God's grace. Verse 14 in verse 15, continue. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God. I love the word blameless. It, it speaks of a private devotion to God that manifests into a public conduct before man. Do you get that? When you are private in your devotion with God, it manifests into a public conduct before man. The word blameless means nobody in your life can find a reason to blame you for anything. Doesn't mean you're perfect. But you walk in such a way where nobody can blame you. That's blameless. The word harmless means sincere, means pure. Because we are children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. I love that. Very quickly, we're children of God without fault. We're not children of God who find fault. Children of God don't find fault. Children of God find faith. Children of God without fault in the midst of, God says, the stage is set. It's a crooked and a perverse generation. Don't you get it? It's distorted. It's perverted. The believer, all you do is step up and allow the light of Christ to shine through you. You don't got to do anything else. In fact, you want to stand out in this miserable world, just start smiling. Real talk. You just start smiling at people. They might think you're crazy, but the light of Christ comes right through a smile. He comes right through eye contact. 
When I deal with your students, I always say, guys, manners matter. Please, thank you. Good morning, good night. Eye contact. And somewhere along the way, we lost sight of manners mattering as believers. We are known as sour people, bitter. I don't want to be known by that, nor do I want this church to be known by that. We continue. Holding fast the word of life. I'm going quickly now because we are on the back end of messages we've covered in weeks past. Holding fast the word of life. This is actually dealing with holding out a lantern. You know, so we went from shining your light to holding fast the word of life. Hold out the word of life. The best imagery I could possibly think about is the Statue of Liberty. Lady, Lady Liberty. Liberta. Lady Liberty is holding a lantern. But she's also in her hand holding a book or a decree of liberty. I love that. What you might not know is she's standing on broken shackles. If that's not the picture of the believer, I don't know what is. Holding out the word of life, holding in my hand the decree of liberty, and I'm standing on the shackles that have been broken because of the cross of Calvary. Holding fast the word of life. That I may rejoice, Paul writes, in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. In other words, all of this being locked up, penning this letter, serving the people that I'm incarcerated with, that brings me joy. Yes, verse 17. And if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Interesting point. He brings up what is known as a drink offering. A drink offering was a smaller sacrifice that was bringing to greater fulfillment the larger sacrifice. In other words, when they would take an oxen or a calf or a goat and they would burn it at the altar, the drink offering was actually wine being poured out. And as the wine was poured out and it would hit the flames, it would create more smoke. And Paul is saying, my life is nothing but a drink offering. See, the greater sacrifice is the Lamb of God, Jesus. And if my life could just pour out and bring more attention to him, it's worth it. Let me say it like this. That which is done without Christ is wasted, but that which is done with Christ is invested. Because a lot of times people would say pouring out the wine was wasteful. And Paul say, no, no matter what you do with Christ, it's an actual investment into eternity. But whatever you do without Christ, you can make a billion dollars. If it's not with Christ, it's actually wasted. So I don't care if you're cleaning the toilet as a janitor or you're cleaning somebody's artery as a doctor. When you do it with Christ, it's an investment. Paul would write, do all things, whether eating or drinking, do it for God's glory. Now very quickly, verses 19 to 24 and then verses 25 to 30, we covered most recently. So I don't want to spend too much time, but here's the point. Paul is actually bringing up Timothy. Timothy was his protege. Timothy was his companion. Timothy was his son in the faith. And Paul highlights his, not career, he doesn't highlight his credentials. He highlights his character. He says, you could trust this young man because of his character. I don't need to send his resume. No, it doesn't matter what school he went to. It doesn't matter his work experience. You could trust this man because of his character. Why? Because Timothy had a submitted mind, which led to having a servant's heart. When you're submitted to the Word of God, when you're submitted to the will of the Father, you will have a servant's heart. It all comes back to service. Service is the clearest way for people to see Jesus. A heart hinged to service is a life that honors Jesus. As an incarcerated man, for four years and seven months, a minister came in every Monday. He was with us on July 21st at the men's gathering. His name was Pastor Victor Hudson. A lot of you have taken a liking to Pastor Victor Hudson. And he came in on one Monday and he said to the inmates, he said, you keep serving in here. You serve until you serve the right person. And then he taught on what he meant. He talked about Joseph being in prison. And we know the story of Joseph. Joseph was sold to slaves uh, uh, by, by his brothers, then accused of rape from his master's wife, and then put into prison with the least of these. And in this moment, misery could have blinded him because misery usually blinds. But if you miss what happens next, you miss this point. 
Genesis chapter 40 says, as an inmate, Joseph took notice to what we know as the butler and the baker. And he said, why are you sad? In other words, he served by looking out for other people's interests. But when you're in your own misery, you can't see anybody else around you that's in misery. But if you don't catch that, Joseph had a heart to serve, and he was looking to serve the people around him, and then he saw somebody with a countenance that was down, and he said, why are you so sad? Which led to them saying, we had bad dreams. Can you interpret the dreams? Which led to him interpreting the dreams. Which led to the Pharaoh hearing about this man that interprets dreams. Which led to him getting out of prison. Do you understand? Had he not noticed somebody else being sad, had he not cared to serve, he would have not had that echo beyond the prison to the palace. You serve until you serve the right person. And finally, verses 25 to 30. If this is your first time here, please forgive me. I just get really, really excited as I speak. Verses 25 to 30 introduces us to a man named Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, his name is related to a Greek and Roman goddess named Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the goddess of fertility, the goddess of sex. And here, this tells us that his mom and his father decided to name him Epaphroditus, which means one who belongs to Aphrodite, which tells us that he was raised in a pagan household. Yet in God's economy, it doesn't matter how you've been raised, the moment he enters into your life, you change and you become Christian. And he takes Epaphroditus and he now uses him. And Paul gives us five characteristics of Epaphroditus, and I'm going to read them. He calls his companion Epaphroditus my brother. We talked about that being love. He calls him fellow worker. That is labor. He calls him fellow soldier. That is being loyal. He says you're a messenger. That means to be sent. And you're one who ministers. That means to serve. In other words, these five characteristics should show up and show out in every believer. We should be family so we love we should work together so we labor we should be like soldiers we're loyal we are messengers we're sent and we're ministers we serve right there love loyal labor you are sent to serve it all comes back to service at the end of the day you might sit here today and say well I don't have the gift that you have so I can't be used by God Matt I'm not a speaker I'm not a teacher I'm not an exhorter I'm not an orator I don't have the gift of singing. I can't be like Pete. I can't be like Morgan playing the drums and singing. I don't have those gifts. And it's not about having the gifts. It's about having the gift of the Spirit. So you might not have every spiritual gift, but every believer has the gift of the Holy Spirit, which enables us to be loving, which empowers us to labor, which activates us to be loyal, to recognize He sends us, to different networks of influence to do one thing, serve. Serve people around you. One verse and we're done. Paul would write, therefore I sent Epaphroditus who got sick. I sent him back to you eagerly. Even though I could use his service here because I'm locked up y'all, I'm gonna send him back because I'm more concerned about what you're thinking about him than my own needs. That when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. I want to say this very bluntly. You'll read it on the screen. The quickest way to diminish your own sorrows is to begin focusing on and helping others. When we help others carry their burdens, we find our strength renewed to continue our journey. The moment you start focusing on others, serving others, you don't have the perspective to focus on yourself. Misery loves company. When you get with people that are miserable, you don't see the needs around you. And there's a proverb that says we are to be generous because the generous soul will be made rich. Consider, how is that possible that I'm giving, yet in the process I get? How am I to be generous, yet I'm the one that becomes rich? He then writes, because he who waters will also be watered himself. In other words, you're struggling, trying to find the peace and the joy 
It's because you're only focused on yourself. You'll never have joy or peace. The moment you start helping and serving others, it's an amazing effect, reciprocity, where God actually gives you greater joy. He gives you greater peace. He gives you greater hope. Because you're watering somebody else, God waters you. And if you're not dead tonight, you're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless. As a church, we believe it's our mission to connect our community to Christ. So, if this message impacted you in any way, we invite you to share this video with family and friends. We'll see you next week.